Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERTIP and ESCCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntec Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTIP and ESCCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERTIP and ESCCP by Herb uh, Nelson, followed by a list of upcoming webinars in the series. After Dr. Nelson's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. Today's event features one presentation on Department of Defense research efforts related to the classification of military munitions using electromagnetic induction data. Dr. Dean Keysweater will be the only presenter and will pause halfway through his presentation to entertain questions from the audience. We will conclude the webinar with a second Q&A session. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions well in advance of the Q&A session. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast audio. Typically, any delay will be fixed if you refresh your screen or call into the conference line. However, if you continue to have problems, please submit a comment using that chat box in the left um, corner of your screen. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Herb Nelson, who has been serving as a CERTIP and ESCCP program manager for munitions response since 2007. In addition, Herb is the executive director of CERTIP and ESCCP. Prior to joining the program, Herb was a research chemist at the Naval Research Lab in Washington, where his work focused on the detection and classification of buried UXO. Herb? Thank you, Rula. I appreciate it. I would like to uh, join Rula in welcoming you all to the uh, 56th of our webinar series. So my overview is relatively quick, as Rula said. We are really two programs here. The first is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. This is a congressionally uh, established program in which we are partners with the Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency. So this, this program sort of really focuses on advanced technology development to address needs of the Department of Defense, particularly environmental needs. And the subject of the uh, talk today, the unexploded ordnance problem, is certainly one of those issues. If we go to the next slide, please. ESTCP, the companion program, is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. A little bit of an awkward name, but it's really meant to be a follow-on in the line to CERTIP in that now this program is designed to demonstrate technologies, either developed by CERTIP or developed in other ways, but demonstrate those technologies at defense sites and uh, prove or not prove that they are both cost-effective and uh, effective. And really the, fourth, the third big bullet in this thing is to promote implementation. We want to facilitate regulatory acceptance, expose customers and stakeholders to these sorts of processes. And again, today's uh, webinar is going to be a perfect example of this. This is really one of our tech transfer efforts. Next slide, please. So we are broken into five program areas. We manage our programs in five program areas. Energy and water, which is only an ESCCP area. And then the other four have both ESCCP and CERTA uh, components. Environmental restoration, which is really traditional chemical cleanup. Munitions response, which is the subject of today's uh, webinar. Resource conservation and resiliency, which really is meant to help uh, DOD installation managers uh, with their threatened and endangered species responsibilities, with, make, with maximizing the availability of training lands, with providing guidance for planners. And then finally, the area named weapon systems and platforms, which is really mostly concerned with the defense industrial base. How can we get hazardous materials out of our depots? How can we find more efficient ways to do the kind of things that make the whole Department of Defense work? On the next slide, please. This is a, a sort of a blow up on munitions response, which I've said a couple of times is the subject of today's webinar. We have a small amount of work finishing up on munitions on land, and this, what, this topic today is uh, concerns that, finishing up with this 
area that we call classification or sometimes we refer to advanced classification. And the, most of the research program and, and the beginnings of the demonstration and validation program these days concern themselves with munitions underwater. And you can see the three areas that we're primarily working in. Mostly we're in the research program. We're just starting to get in the SDCP in those areas. Next slide, please. So here are the upcoming webinars through the uh, first part of September. You can see all of our uh, program areas that I talked about a couple slides ago are, are represented here. So I would encourage you, if any of these uh, strike your fancy, to go to the website and uh, sign up to uh, get a, both a reminder and to attend these. Here's the website on the uh, slide that Ruler just switched to. There's uh, tools and training and webinar series. You can find that. You can also uh, find links to past webinars and other things you might want on that same page. And then on the next slide, please. Uh, we would be remiss if we didn't remind you that we have finally, after a number of years, received permission to restart our symposium uh, series. Many of you that are long-time uh, followers of sort of an ESCCP, I'm sure, have gone to this symposium. Those of you that are new to us, we, we've been gone for about five years, so you don't know about this, but it's a very uh, valuable. I mean, obviously, I would say that, huh, because we're putting it on. But even when I was a PI years ago, it is a very valuable venue for interactions with your peers and learning new things that are going on to sort of an ESCCP. And as you see at the bottom bullet there, registration is open now, so we'd encourage you to check that out. And on the next slide. We get ready to move to Dean. All right. Thank you so All much, right. Herb. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dean uh, Keysweater, who is a Chief Scientist and Program Director at Acorn Science and Innovation in Cary, North Carolina. Dean's current research focuses on the development of methods and technologies for the classification of buried munitions and the integration of quality systems and products to the data analysis workflow. Dean earned a BS degree in geology from Fort Hayes State University in Kansas and both master's and doctoral degrees in geophysics from Kansas University. In addition, he has an MBA from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. With that, I turn it over to you, Dean. Thank you, Rula, and uh, thank you, Herb. Also, thank you all for joining uh, it's certainly my pleasure to talk about classification of military munitions today, and, and I do appreciate your time. All right, so here's the agenda. We'll uh, first define the problem, then discuss the promise that advanced physical classification brings to the table. Uh, after that, I'll present a data analysis software package called US Analyze, and I'll then discuss the integral role that data quality plays throughout the data analysis effort. And, and focus a bit, especially focus on our efforts to evaluate and document data quality. Finally, I'll present a high-level description of the data uh, processing that is performed for dynamic and for static processing. Uh, and then I'll conclude uh, with a brief summary. All right, so here's the big picture problem. To prepare for combat operations, the Department of Defense used military munitions for testing and training. As a result of, their, of this testing, the unexploded ordnance and discarded military munitions are present on former ranges and testing sites all over the place. To introduce the challenge associated with remediating these sites, uh, I want to show a quick movie. This movie uh, is an edited version of, of, of another movie clip that was shown by the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, and you can find that entire presentation at this link here. So I have a next a movie clip that I wanted to show you, and it should be playing now. All right, so that's that's the movie clip. So uh, there's two takeaway messages I want to point out first. Uh, tremendous explosive power. Uh, so safety has to be paramount in our in, in, in our cleanup effort. The danger of live but unexploded ordnance is clearly evident in this picture. And number two, there are lots and lots of fragments. This movie shows that the tank is the target. And we don't actually see what the tank looks like after the blast, but I imagine it's in many pieces. But even without the tank, 
the shell casing of the munition item itself explodes into many pieces and fragments. And, you know, if you, if you think about military training exercise that has a hundred of these uh, explosions or a thousand or a hundred thousand of these, you can imagine that there are, in fact, lots and lots of fragments present on the site. The presence of lots and lots of fragments, which really are non-hazardous scrap metal, presents a problem for us. It is not unusual to find a thousand or more pieces of fragment or non-targets of interest. For each UXO, or I'm going to use the term target of interest for the UXO, the graph on the right shows uh, the projected cleanup costs, and it was determined by the Defense Science Board in 2003, so it's a bit it's a bit dated, but it is broken down by task and illustrates the point I'm trying to make here. And that is that the removal of scrap metal is the primary cost driver. Mitigating these costs is one of the objectives of classifications. We'll also see uh, in the later half of the stage another major emphasis of classification is essentially the quality of decision and the record trail that is left. So the focus of this brief addresses the problem of classifying a bearing object as UXO or not based on the analysis of electromagnetic conduction data. The geophysical data in this picture were acquired during a live site demonstration program and, and they are presented here in a false color image uh, in, in plan map format. The X axis is eastings and the Y axis is in northing so we're looking down in space. The blue colors represent essentially site background, and the brightly colored anomalies identify regions in space for which buried metal is present. And as you can see, there are a variety of anomalies here, a number of them, some large, some small. Our challenge is to decide which of these anomalies uh, identify fragments and which identify targets of interest or the UXO that we're looking for. Advanced Geophysical Classification, or AGC, uh, presents a method for thinking through these decisions in a structural, structured and principled manner. The process is based on physical principles, it is transparent, and it is repeatable. Uh, at the risk of getting ahead of myself, I want the symbols on the map further illustrate the challenge. As part of the demonstration program, inert seed items were in place, and all of the sources, every single thing we detected was excavated, regardless of the classification. Now, this was done to provide ground truth. The plus signs on this map that you can see identify anomalies that were determined to be greater than the background response. The red circles identify the UXO. In this particular case, they happen to be all seed, seeded items, um, targets of interest that were in place by the project team, but nevertheless, they are things that we're looking for. So the black circles identify um, anomalies that need to be excavated. So there's two takeaway issue, uh, ideas here. First, all of the TOI were found in this area. And, and number two, a tremendous amount of work and costs associated with removing the fragments could have, had, could have, could have been avoided if in fact, we had utilized the classification decision as opposed to just trying to baseline this performance. All right, so here is the AGC process, perhaps grossly oversimplified. Um, but nevertheless, data are collected using electromagnetic induction sensors, and a picture of one is shown in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, and these sensors are designed specifically for finding and classifying buried metal. These sensors are complex. They consist of a handful of transmitters and multiple tens of receivers arranged at a fixed locations throughout uh, the platform. They also record GPS and inertial navigation data streams, um, typically asynchronously. Once collected, the data are processed and analyzed using algorithms specifically designed for classification. And the analysis, the, you know, on the upper right-hand piece, the analysis process includes essentially two phases. First, um, we characterize the source object via inversion techniques, and then we make a numerical decision based on how well the derived source characteristics match similar information for our UXO. 
the folks of this talk, UX Analyze and the associated quality control processes, live in this second and third piece of the process. I want to use this slide to introduce what happens kind of behind the scenes during the actual analysis. The data on the left represent individual transients, and these transients are the direct measurements from each of the sensor's received coils. So it is the raw data that comes from the sensor. These raw data cannot be used as measured, however, because they are strongly affected by the barrel depth and orientation of the object. The barrel depth and orientation of the object, however, are, you know, do not inherently tell us anything about the nature of the source object, so they're, they're not particularly useful in that regard. The measured data, because of that, the measured data have to be processed. And a mathematical model is used to separate those parts of the measure signature that are unique to the object uh, from the barrel depth and object orientation shown on the right. The unique signals are called the magnetic polarizabilities, and there are three polarizabilities that are derived for each source item, and they contain all the information that can be obtained about the source object using EMI data. Axisymmetric symmetric source objects like long and slender UXO have one dominant polarizability and two smaller but equal polarizabilities as shown, as shown here. Our classification decision is based entirely upon how well these derived polarizabilities uh, resemble polarizabilities that have been derived from known targets during, during testing. AGC has been successfully realized by multiple firms at lots of sites and with a wide range of UXO and clutter distributions. But the second bullet presents a new wrinkle that I want to discuss in the next few slides. Uh, and I want to discuss it principally because it is critical to the successful implementation uh, of the technology transfer that's going forward. And that is that the emergency of quality systems, structured quality assurance, and quality control processes, and the required digital audit trail has forever changed the business of munitions response. Last year, the government created the Advanced Geophysical Classification Quality Assurance Project Plan. That's a big word, uh, words, the AGC CLOP. The document lays out a series of plans and procedures that help to assure that quality decisions are realized. So step-by-step -step instructions as to hopefully not make a mistake. You say lessons learned from previous classification demonstrations form the foundation of many of these standard processes and procedures that are in here. So just a few comments. The ADC CLAP uh, specifies, in my, my view, it specifies the requirements and encourages structure, schedule, and standard products. And for us in the ADC world, these products include things like sensor function tests, instrument verification tests, background validation tests, cluster analyses, and analysis uh, and status reports. We will look at most of these products in a few minutes, but taken as a whole, uh, they really do help to assure consistent high-quality products. So I want to use this tree pictured on the right as a mental image regarding the relationship between the CLAP and the AGC. So you have to bear with me for a minute here. I saw this tree last Thanksgiving while on vacation in Nashville, Tennessee, and it looked a bit odd when I when I saw it. And something strange about the way it, you know was its relationship to the fence uh, it appeared odd to me. So I walked a bit closer, and when I got close, it was easy to see why the tree uh, caught my attention. Parts of the tree, uh, the tree trunk and branches were on one side of the fence and other parts were on the other. The, the, the tree had completely engulfed the fence during its growth. And it wasn't the only tree that, that had done this to the fence or other trees around this fence that, that happened. Um, and the, essentially, the agency clap strengthens our classification decision much as the fence strengthens this tree. The quality requirements of the CLOP have been woven into the quality control processes and products of UX Analyze. 
And so the QAP, you know, whether you like it or not, it forces compliance and good behavior and thereby helps to assure quality classification decisions. So the structure and the framework and the, and the, and the quality system of the, of the QAP and the ISO 17025 standard have been woven into UX Analyze and, and the products that we produce, and it really does help us uh, provide a better product. So it's kind of a, a, a strange image, but nevertheless, I hope, <laughs> I hope, you know, I hope you remember how that works. So, all right. So now I want to focus a bit more on the data analysis software. ESDCP funded and adopted this approach for transferring data analysis capabilities. And the objectives of the UX Analyze project uh, were to uh, create an analysis workflow that is transparent, modular, and commercially available. To that end, we tried to merge physics, uh, physics inspired or physics based dipole model analyses with commercial data processing software packages or package. We created an efficient data analysis tools, procedures, and quality products, and we tried hard to institutionalize lessons learned, and we'll look at that more in a bit. A second objective was to very aggressively transfer classification technologies, and finally, we wanted to integrate um, quality control measures throughout the program. So UX Analyze, the software product that resulted from this is essentially called UX Analyze, and it does uh, provide the means to analyze EMI data acquired by the classification grade sensors uh, from start to finish. Uh, it is transparent, it's tri you know, the, the coding of it is transparent, it's modular, and it is commercially available. So I won't be able to talk in detail about uh, the many, many steps within UX Analyze, but the guiding principles that we adopted early on uh, essentially tried to allow us to create transparent and modular workflows. And the first principle that we, we established was we wanted to require and assure quality input. Next, we created bundles or analysis functions, and the idea was that users should be able to access each individual step within the bundle if desired, but they should also be able to run 10 to 15 steps at once using the standardized workflow. And finally, we promoted the notion um, of standardized quality products and reports, essentially aligning the products with the requirements uh, from the cloud. With regards to a technical progress snapshot, uh, UX Analyze is integrated uh, into GeoSoft's Oasis Montage, which is a commercially available data processing and visualization software package. Uh, tools and capabilities have been developed um, to accomplish quality control of the input data, dynamic data processing and analysis, static data processing and analysis, uh, making the classification decision, and documenting it. So essentially A to Z. With regards to technical maturity, UX Analyze has been used by multiple firms and government agencies to demonstrate and benchmark classification capabilities uh, at many sites since 2008. During this time, uh, the image on the left shows a number of technical details which were systematically worked on. Um, and and the demo, at the demonstration sites from 2008 up through 2016, you can see that a tremendous amount of work was done in the early years up through 13. Um, and a lot of people were used this and it really helped to, uh, to establish and drive the program flow. So a summary of the results, this is just a very quick snapshot, but some example results are shown in this figure here. This figure was made for ITRC uh, in 2014, and the link of that, of that page is there. Um, the plot shows classification results for seven different sites, seven of the, of the early sites. Uh, and they're each plotted as a function of their anomaly density, which is increasing along the x-axis. Uh, and the UXO, UXO diversity plotted on the y-axis. And there are two bar graphs for each of these sites. The blue bar graph on the left uh, shows the percentage of correctly classified UXO. 
The gray bar on the right side of each small graph represents the percentage of correctly classified clutter. So a perfect classification would result in each bar uh, up to 100%. That would be a perfect classification at the edit site. As you can see, uh, the results are not perfect, but a very large percentage of non-QI could have been safely left in the ground without leaving UXO in the ground at these sites. The results from these and other demonstrations clearly show that AGC works very well at sites, especially with low diversity and density, UXO density. But as the complexity of the site increases, what we found throughout the years was that AGC still works. But just a smaller percentage of the non-TOI could be confidently left in the ground. All right, I want to say a few words about lessons learned. During the demonstration since 2008, and especially the early ones, many mistakes were made, some by others, but mostly by us and, and, and my group. Each time a mistake was made, uh, we tried hard to understand the failure and to take steps to prevent it from happening in the future. This is the aspect of, of institutionalizing the lesson learned. We want to build in the solution so that other people don't repeat our failures. The list on this page highlights some of the mistakes, and they include times where we didn't appreciate uh, or we did not ex exhibit poor, uh, we exhibited poor quality control. Sometimes we used bad backgrounds. We also sometimes assumed a single source when in fact there was more than one item underneath the sensor. Um, we also used incomplete libraries. And sometimes we do not appreciate the effects that low signal to noise measurements have in the final decision. So these failures resulted in changes to our analysis schemes in the following ways. Uh, poor quality control. We adopted data visualizations and provided more rigorous evaluations now. With regards to backgrounds, first we, uh, we made a standard practice to evaluate each and every background. And then we improve the statistical tools and improve the visualizations uh, that, that we have access to for the backgrounds. With regards to single sources, more often than not, there, there's more than one piece of metal producing an anomaly. And the sensors that I showed in the picture earlier, the sensors are good enough uh, to allow us to utilize multi-source inversion routines instead of always uh, assuming a single source. And so this, of course, the adoption of multi-source solvers has been now and now it is routinely uh, used. With regards to the library, there's been a fair amount of focus on the library and um, historically sometimes it was incomplete. So we devised standard methods that are built into the flow that help us to recognize uh, clusters of objects that are not explained by the library. In essence, we improve the library if, if needed on a site-by-site -site basis. And with regards to low signal to noise, we modified the decision logic uh, to err on the conservative side. So essentially, we adopt, adopted ways to, to mitigate all of these, these problems. This slide lists the major updates associated with the latest version of UX Analyze. All of these changes were made in order to improve the modularity uh, the processing speed or just the general functionality of UX Analyze. But as you can see by that list, um, a lot of the code was touched, was rewritten in C, uh, it was standardized, and we made just a lot of improvements. The latest version has been approved, uh, has been approved uh, for use during DAGCAP required field demonstrations and it was approved for use by the DOD Environmental Data Quality Work Group, Advanced Geophysical Classification Subgroup. So there's a big name for you. And with that background, I'm going to stop now for questions and a little break. In the second half of it, we'll focus more uh, on technical details related to uh, quality control and to processing. Great. Thank you so much, Dean. We've actually received a number of questions. I'm going to take you to slide 22. Um, and we have a question from EPA uh, that says the following. On this slide, why are so many other anomalies not flagged as picks? Are they metal? 
Okay, so do you mean this one, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so, so many anomalies that are not flagged. So the, the X's here, I'm not really sure I know the question, the question. The small X's indicate, and perhaps you can't see this, but they indicate and they identify anomalies that were selected as being anomalous by probably amplitude pickers. The red, I'll just reiterate kind of what these show, the red are essentially after the fact items that were targets of interest that were removed. And these these black ones, uh, symbols up here, identify anomalies that after analysis were recommended to be excavated. So the vast majority of these bumps, all of them with the plus, uh, were essentially picked as a, above background, but the, but the classification process um, essentially convinced us or told us that the, the source parameters that derive and produce each of those small anomalies could not possibly be one of our targets of interest. And, that's, and that second piece, I guess, is, um, well, uh, perhaps talk a little bit more in the second half. But Great. Thank you, Dean. Uh, we have a question from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Can you please expand on what you mean by bad background? Um, yeah, sure. So the backgrounds are, uh, are collected and used during processing. And the purpose of the background is to try and measure and record the signature of the sensor itself, the signature of, of the ground, of the, you know, the soil and geology beneath the sensor, and also record any temporal variations that occur during the survey. This background response is subtracted from a measurement that's made above a, an, an item that is that we're trying to investigate. So a, a data will be acquired above a metallic item. We would then subtract the signature of the background from the measurement over the UXO item, and then we analyze and interpret the, the that difference to data. And so backgrounds can be bad if they are if they are truly not in locations that are free from metallic sources. If you acquire a background that is nearby a metallic source, it will not be representative of what the ground is without the metallic source. So, so that's a, 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 an example of a bad background is is if it's truly not representative of a background. Sometimes the backgrounds can be, um, you know, there can be a problem with the background. So maybe the voltage was low. Or there are other reasons that the, the data itself for that background is, is, is not appropriate for use, uh, it does not properly represent those things we're trying to subtract. And so that's what it means, is, uh, is if we use a background that doesn't really represent, you know, the source of the, of the sensor itself, the geology, or the temporal variations. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the Department of Defense. Is there a sensor that goes to a depth of two meters? <laughs> uh, well, I would say yes. It depends upon what the size of the object is. Uh, I would say no if you're looking for most of the UXO that we're after. So so our, our depth of detection um, and and, and the, the, the depth at which these things work is, is, is less than two meters. Um, and the electromagnetics, just essentially the physics of electromagnetics uh, prohibits us from um, or stops us from acquiring signal that is of good enough quality to invert and use for classification purposes for, for the objects of our size at that depth. Thank you, Dean. A question from the Navy. Can the software adapt to rough terrain typical of the Western U.S. by maintaining acceptable QA, QC standards? Also, how does the software perform at sites with abundant metal-bearing rocks? All right. So uh, the answer to the first one, I think, is yes. There have been demonstration sites kind of all over. I guess I didn't – I don't have – a uh, map at the moment, but if you go to the, the ESCCP website, there are maps that show where these demonstration sites have have been conducted, and they really are kind of all over the place. Um, you do have to be more careful, of course, in, in some locations. And 
so with regards to the second piece with with iron bearing or magnetic rocks it that does present a problem and it can limit uh the performance uh of these sensors and so you you do have to be careful with um with using it in those environments I would say though that if if you follow the quap and if you follow the i v s and all and all of the quality control measures that we're going to look at uh you will know you will you will know whether it's going to work or not it, it won't be a surprise um so so it, you know the iron bearing rocks are a problem it can limit it to where it doesn't work but but if you follow the process uh it it should it should clearly show you up front that you you know you should or should not use be able to trust your decisions. Thank you, Dean. Uh, another question from EPA, and I'm going to take you to slide um, 33 because it's associated with this slide. Um, the question goes as follows. On this slide, you show one R&D focus area being a move from multi-solver to n-solver. What effect does the actual number of pieces of metal below the sensor have on the polarizability solution? And does the current end solver give the correct answer for a TOI that may be intermingled with five, six, or ten pieces of fragments? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So the 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 um, so the interesting thing about solvers is that. You know, we're trying to, to find, we're trying to derive a set of model parameters that, given the dipole model, best produce a signal sphere that matches our data. And so, if we assume there's a single source, but in fact there are two sources, the inversion algorithm will derive a set of answers and a set of parameters for that object that best matches the observed data. The problem is that it just won't represent reality. It won't be correct. The, the parameters that you derive for one object will not adequately describe the two objects that are physically there. Right? And so you need a multi-source solver that, instead of assuming one object, assumes multiple sources. Um, so that's essentially the transition is, is you know, the, the single source solver will give us answers, but they may or may not be correct. And they definitely won't be correct if there's multiple sources. So the second piece, uh, will it work if there's a UXO item in the presence of, you know, two, three, six, or ten additional objects? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of hard to predict. If there's two or three, I would say the chances are very good, yes. It, it often does. If it's four, six, or ten, the answer is probably no, because there's just not enough information to do to, to, to properly uh, to properly constrain the solutions. Thank you, Dean. Another question from EPA, uh, Region 9 in this case. What is the maximum anomaly density where classification can be used, such as OB, OD disposal unit? Yeah, so this, I'm not sure I'm the best guy to answer this. This, this, this question has come up, and, and I know if you go to the ITRC documents, there's probably guidelines for that. Um, I... I don't know off the top of my head what that what what is being recommended as that as that number. You know, there are some assumptions that go along with those numbers, right? So if if there are the maximum number of anomalies per acre, if all of the items are in one location, right, then it's a tremendous problem. If they're all uniformly distributed across a site, it's a different problem. So there are assumptions made with that try you know, trying to make those types of statements and, and I'm not sure I'm the best guy there to do that. So I you know I think maybe what I'd recommend is if you follow up with an email or something, we can direct you to some guidance in that regard. Thank you very much. Um, all right, uh, given the large interest from EPA in this topic so far and the questions that we've received, can you tell us how well uh, regulatory agents have accepted UX Analyze, Dean? <laughs> well, they love it. <laughs> Uh, well, no, I, so I don't know. I'm a biased guy. Um, uh, I, I think good. I think good. You know, the the EDQW and um, Jordan Allison and, and Herb Nelson have have done a lot of work in trying to bring uh, the regulatory community on board and making sure that we're using common language and we have a common understanding of what is expected and what's not. Um, 
the I the, the DAG CAP program and the ISO 17025 program and the the uh, the AGC QAP go a tremendous long ways in regards to setting up processes and and incremental steps that are each QC'd, such that at, at the end of the day, the regulators can can buy into the decision. Um, so I would say I think I think very good. You know, um, I certainly can't speak for all, but I think that in general the the um, you know the acceptance of this approach and the rigorous nature of the audit trail, uh, and the the you know some people may call it excessive, but the but the um, but all of the seated and the quality control steps that are done uh, provides a very good confidence. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, by and large, regulators are accepting of this approach. Thank you. And one last question, because it's come up twice um, before we move on to the second part of your presentation, and then towards the end, we'll ask any remaining questions. Can you tell us whether there is a standardized library for target signatures that is used throughout the industry? Um, yes, there is. Um, so there's been an effort to create the standard uh, library, and, and, and Herb Nelson and the ESCCP uh, group funded that, and Parsons put it together. And, and this library, as a research program, has been turned over the, to the Department of Defense. Um, uh, we have an official UXO librarian who is in charge of this library. And, and essentially the idea is that the library, uh, which, which is a set of, me of measurements, the data as well as the polarizabilities, uh, is maintained by the Department of Defense. And as projects are initiated, it will be distributed to the contractors uh, kind of at the time of contract award. So there is, there is a library. There are methods for adding to that site library if, if site-specific munitions are found and present. Um, uh, so the answer is yes, there is, there is a library. Thank you very much, and I'd like to invite you to please continue your presentation. And as a reminder for everyone, keep the questions coming, and we'll have plenty of time after um, Dean's concluding remarks to get to your questions. Go ahead, Dean. All right, all right thank you. Okay, um, so quality control is a central part of the data analysis workflow and a major, a major focus of the QAP requirements and the related standard uh, procedures. It has been clearly demonstrated that if input data are of high quality, the resulting analysis is correct. And if the analysis is correct, the classific classification decision is also correct. And so I'm going to introduce the major QC checks next and go into a bit of detail of those. And after the QC checks, which really is the essence of this garbage in, garbage out, right? We're trying to keep the garbage out. Once you pass the quality control, then we will move into a couple of the slides and talk about the dynamic data processing and get a glimpse into the queued, you know, what happens during the queued processing of queued data as well. All right, so at the risk of, of oversimplifying these tasks, I want these tasks. I want to talk about five specific quality checks. These quality checks are required uh, to assure quality data. And remember that we want to not only verify that all is well, but we also want to document performance uh, for later audits. The QC checks that we're going to talk about today include sensor function tests, the instrument verification strip tests, the field data checks. We're going to look at the background validation tests, which gets you know one of the addresses in one of the questions just a, a minute ago. And we'll also talk about the repeat background measurement checks. We'll look at um, at each of these important QC checks individually next. All right, here's the sensor function test. So this check is a very straightforward test to document that the EMI sensor is working as designed. The test involves putting an industry standard object on the sensor and measuring the response. We look at all received, all received channels. Sensor function tests are performed at the start and end of each day and, and at two hour intervals throughout the day. 
The sensor function test data are compared to previous measurements and to reference files provided by equipment manufacturers. And, and if unreasonable changes are observed, the integrity of the data is suspect and cannot be used. So this is a, a rigorous test for, for just the sensor itself. If um, systematic changes are observed, a root cause investigation is initiated and, and we don't move forward until it's fixed. The instrument verification strip, the IVS. Now uh, this is another test to verify and document sensor performance and it is essentially the second test that we do. Um, we collect these data even before collecting any of the field data. So this test involves collecting data over a limited number of test objects uh, that are chosen to be suitable for the anticipated UXO on site. The measured data are analyzed using standard methods and the resulting polarizabilities are compared to all the other measurements taken over that particular test object and also to library reference polarizabilities. Deviations in object location, burial depth, size, model misfit uh, are all documented using standard plots like the plot on the left. Now, these tests are required at the beginning and end of each day, uh, but it is good practice, however, to perform these tests during the day at regular intervals as well. So here, we, the purpose is to test not only the, the sensor itself, but also uh, the, the ancillary sensors, the GPS, uh, the IMU, and, and the software, uh, software solutions. Here we verify the quality of, of the data being collected itself. And this is done to guard against system failure while collecting data. Um, and, and, and to do that, we essentially we, we conduct this test uh, on all measured data as it's being imported in, into OASIS, so it's an automatic check. We review and record as the data is coming in things like, uh, like the battery transmit currents, um, survey speeds, the data gaps, time gaps, GPS coordinates, and we identify any saturated uh, EMI coils uh, responses. If any of these checks are out of normal, the data are quarantined and the analyst is notified. So any and all systematic problems are investigated if they're observed and once corrected, uh, once the, the systematic problems are corrected, uh, the data gaps would be, the data problems would be recollected. We wouldn't use the bad data. So this is a QC map for, for static data. Again, as the data comes into the system, we, we evaluate it. Similar to the last figure, all static data are automatically checked at during import. All the problems are flagged and quarantined. And in, in addition to the, the visual image that I showed in the last figure and at the top of this one, uh, we also save uh, a detailed listing of the error codes for the analyst to review. And this is shown at the bottom of the bottom right hand side. And so the, the analyst receives not only a visual cue of which, which data collections were essentially out of normal, which ones are not, you know, looks like some sensor problem, but also receives, you know, a listing of, of which of the flags and um, the error codes to, to say why that was bad. All right, so this, now I want to move on to the background validation. So there's, there's essentially two checks with regards to the backgrounds. Um, and again, I guess to, to address the question uh, addressed earlier, these measurements um, are acquired at the background locations to remove signatures like the soils, you know, or to the sensor itself or to temporal changes. So this test, this is the, the first of the two tests, is called the background validation test. And we use it to verify and document that an area that is selected as background um, is in fact clean of sources and, and is actually suitable for use. In order to be used as a background, the location uh, must first be free from all metal, but, but it also must produce signatures that are much smaller than the UXO item that was chosen to drive the detection limits. So the test involves making multiple measurements in a one meter area. After the user specifies the detection target of interest, so once the user tells the software what you know what munition you're looking for and at what depth, 
the algorithm uses the measured data and it inserts an appropriate synthetic signature into the measured data and it inverts it. In order to pass, the data must be adequately spaced and the detection limit UXO must be correctly classified. So these are standard plots that are produced to support some of the requirements of the CRAP. And these standard products are shown here. The data on the right, well, the data on the left passed, but the data on the right failed. And it failed essentially because the data were not collected in space properly. The, um, you know, there, there's supposed to be uh, some distance between the samples. And in this case, the middle one was not in the middle. And because of that, it did not properly sample the space. And so we say that this data collection does not prove that space is clean. And so it failed. And so the user would have to go acquire additional data at this location in order to show, in fact, that, uh, that, the site, that this area was suitable for a background response. Once the background locations are chosen and validated, the users go to these locations every few hours. Uh, and they do this to verify that the, and document that the sensor is working correctly. But these background data need to be checked, uh, checked for quality. And the first check, of course, is we can verify that each background measurement was collected at one of the previously validated locations, right? We can compare where it was collected and see if that is, in fact, the right spot. Uh, but in addition to looking just at the location, we can also compare the readings themselves. And so the data on the left show the transients collected during one of, you know, a, a particular uh, static measurement. These transients are compared to all of the other, uh, over time, to all of the other uh, transients to document that the sensor readings are consistent. If background measurements pass, uh, they are then used to remove the sensor drift and geologic response, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, during production, the CLAP says that we should do background readings uh, at least every two hours. So these are fairly uh, often events. So this is the last of the five major quality checks. And again, these checks are all kind of up front. It's a fair amount of checking and validation up front. But the purpose is to make sure that we have good quality data coming in to the inversion algorithms. And so we'll look next at the dynamic data collection piece. Dynamic data collection refers to situations in which we, uh, we collect data while moving. The idea is to, is to survey the entire area in order to first identify anomalies and then to characterize them somehow. So, so the characterization could simply be a listing of signal amplitudes or, as we're going to talk here, it could be a more thorough investigation such as an intelligent source selection process. I want to just re remind you that the EMI sensor consists of multiple ind independent sensors. You know, there is an EMI sensor itself, there's one or more GPS systems, there's an inertial navigation system. All of these data streams are coming into the data, to the data acquisition system asynchronously. And because of this, we have to perform a number of steps during this dynamic processing piece uh, in order to make sense of the dynamic data. The first step is to integrate all of these data streams. Um, by utilizing the timestamps. So we, we record the data stream and, and we look at the timestamps and we align them all. Once they are spatially registered, we identify and locate all the anomalies. We then characterize the source objects using the computer modeling that, that we uh, briefly described earlier. And we may filter the sources based on the source characteristics. And finally, we create a master list. So the next two slides are going to illustrate some of these some of these steps and some of the data products that we have. All right, let's first look at the left image, which, which shows uh, measured data. It's a, it's a portion of the measured data that is acquired in dynamic mode. The X and Y uh, axes correspond to distances as they did before, eastings and northings. The false colors are based upon the amplitudes. Uh, in this case, it's the amplitudes of the horizontal received coils. So it's only part of the measurement is, is shown here. Red colors are highs, and the, the background values are plotted in green. The data on the right uh, are the same data, but after a bit of processing. And the processing was designed to help isolate and identify individual anomalies. In this case here, we've applied a dipole filter, 
and are plotting essentially the correlation co- coefficients that is returned from the fitting function. And this is part of the intelligence source selection process. It's a, it, there's a series of steps that allows us to try and make a good decision. Um, I just, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a, a typo here. Um, intelligence should be informed source selection, Michael. Heaven's sakes, typos will get the best of us. All right, so the next step is to take a look at what happens after the full inversion. I have intelligent here. This should be informed as well, so this is not very uh, intelligent, apparently. Um, but anyways, the results of the full inversion about each anomaly is a list of sources, their locations, uh, and their characteristics. So it's a lot more than just amplitude picking. Uh, and it results in a master list that you know can then be used um, for either queuing or for making other decisions. And I want to just remind you, we've gone from a map of anomalies uh, to a list of sources. That's kind of a, a, a distinct thing. And we've done that for a couple of reasons. The, the location error associated with picking an anomaly is, 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 can, be, is, can be large. It can be plus or minus a half a meter or something. The location error associated with the list of sources, because we have inverted the data and are now using all of the components, the location error associated with this is measured in decimeters, usually a couple of decimeters. Um, so it, the location is very good. So these sources, this master list after this process of informed source selection, uh, are then passed on to the queuing and, and for the final classification analysis. On occasion, the list can be filtered to remove certain classes of sources, uh, for example, those that are too small uh, to be possibly of interest or even used as a basis for classification itself. Once all the possible sources are placed on the master list, the next step is to queue them or acquire stationary data, uh, data and, uh, and send them on through the analysis process. All right, classification data collected while stationary, which this is static processing, so stationary, the, the, these data provide more information than that collected while moving. Analyzing these static data is the foundation of the AGC approach and it is where essentially we can turn the crank in my cartoon before. This is where we turn the crank. The lots and lots of you know calculations are done um, and we only perform this analysis on the data that has passed the five QC steps discussed earlier. So the graphical interface on the right is labeled validate library but uh, shows some of the steps involved. It is one of two static processing bundles. The tasks are performed top to bottom, you know, as shown by that arrow, and then the routines pass the data along as it is analyzed. The settings boxes on the right contain specific instructions and parameters for each step, uh, and this bundle uh, essentially was designed to minimize user error and maximize throughput. Now, I don't have time to we can't go into all of the details associated with the settings or with the, with the individual tools you're doing, but our focus here is a basic understanding of the major steps that are that are located just above there. So we've talked a lot about the QC data inputs. Um, so the next one is the inversions, the library, and self match rank, and document. The inversion step, again, is, is where we invert the data and derive the polarizabilities that we talked about before. The library and self-match piece is where we numerically evaluate the similarity between our tar you know, the polarizabilities of our target of unknown versus our library. The rank step is where we prioritize the target. We put them in order. Uh, those that are most similar to UXO are placed at the top of the two excavate lists, while those that are least similar are placed at the bottom. And the final stage is to document the document the results and and so I want to use some of the document, some of the figures to, in the next few slides, to show you, um, uh, to perhaps provide a, shed a little bit of light on these, the, these various steps. All right, so this is one of our standard plots, and we, you know, create this in part in, in uh, to, uh, to satisfy requirements of the graph. This plot is one of the first standard plots we create. Um, it is generated after an inversions in library match, but before the final classification decision is made. 
the large curves on the left uh, in, in the bottom left hand portion of the slide uh, show the, the polarizations for two objects. Source being investigated is, is shown in blue, uh, and the best match library signature is shown in red. The number after the words decision metric uh, above the curves is a measure of the similar uh, the measure of the similarity between the two curves. In this case, uh, it ranges from zero to one, where one is a, is a very good match, a perfect match actually. The plan map in the upper right hand uh, portion of the figure shows the relative locations of all sources detected under the footprint of the sensor. Ideally, we like these to be in the center of the sensor because that's what we're trying to do, but uh, so this is a good, a good case. The depth slice at the bottom shows the corresponding burial depths and horizontal locations of each of the possible sources that are under the footprint of the sensor. So as during processing, the computer generates one plot for each and every source item detected by each of the queued data collections. It also accumulates all of the source data into a large databases, you know, to pass on to later analyses. The next document that is produced uh, is produced just after the classification and ranking steps have been performed. The right hand side uh, of this figure, the portion shaded in light gray, is the same information and plots the previous plot. But now we've, we, we have run us through the classification piece. Um, so the top left graph is new. It shows essentially a 2D image of the relative size and decay of the object under test versus all of the other objects present to the site. The color indicates the classification decision. The red is used to identify sources that need to be excavated, and the green color identifies sources that are not similar to sources of objects in our library. So essentially the green would be objects that we would uh, recommend that be left in the ground. The bottom left figure on the, uh, the figure on the left rather shows the ranked sources and is also color coded, color coordinated. We have a third plot, the final, the final plot that we make is, is shown here. And it is produced after the digging phase is complete. For each source that is removed, we compare and contrast the anticipated results, which the anticipated results, uh, remember, are those that are produced by the classification process. We compare those results with the ground truth information that is provided. And it, it is essentially a sanity check. We want to make sure that all the pieces of information that come out of the ground actually do make sense and support the classification decision whether or not it was a UXO, right? So sometimes clutter is, is recovered. We want to make sure that, in fact, if clutter is recovered, the polarizabilities and all the signature and the decisions that are made, so, you know, all make sense with that. So this is another plot that essentially we create in response to satisfy some of the, the requirements of the, of the plot. All right, so AGC methods provide detailed information about each and every source, whether they are excavated uh, or left in the ground. And these include uh, QC plots and statistics, source signatures, and numeric decision statistics. The final product of an AGC investigation is a ranked or prioritizing list. And this list is prioritized from those that are most similar to one of our uh, UXO to the least similar. Uh, similar. The list contains detailed information, and as shown here, there are a, a unique source ID. So every piece of metal in the ground is given a unique source ID. Um, there is a numerical decision statistic presented, and if ordinance, we 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 tell you what type the type or size the ordinance is. In addition to this, the analysts provide a stop dig threshold. This threshold. Um, essentially is the line between the red and the green. Um, and it is chosen by the analyst during the process and it is made such that all of the targets of interest at the time the decision was made were properly classified. So all of the known UXO at the time that this would be uh, made would be properly classified according to this, um, this, this stop dig threshold. Uh, which means that if new and or different target of interest are encountered, 
then the classification analysis needs to be reworked, needs to be redone. The US Analyze software was developed with funding with, from ESCCP and it, and it is made available to US government contractors and regulators uh, and it's made available by GSOF Incorporated and the link is shown here. Uh, GSOF is also working at the moment to develop learning path documentation and it will be for the target availability this summer uh, or fall. So today I've only been able to present general ideas and concepts, but, but if you are interested in a more detailed understanding of the actual workflow and, and looking at the behind the scenes, we do present uh, analysis workshops periodically and there are a couple coming up, uh, one in June, one in July. Um, I think the space may be limited, but, um, but there may be a, some more coming in the future. All right, so the software that I described here runs on, on network PCs. And, and this is good, historically convenient for us, the analysts, but it presents really difficulties for trying to share data products or when trying to uh, let you know others audit the process and decisions. To alleviate these concerns, we've started an ESCCP-funded uh, program to, to, to migrate the entire process to the cloud. And in doing so, we're going to leverage the tremendous capabilities of the cloud and basically receive a number of benefits. And these include, and this is not, these include uh, no local software installations necessary. So you won't need to install the software locally. No local computing resources required. Increased efficiencies, productivity, and transparencies. Um, automatic version control and activity logging, minimal data transfers, and increased processing speed and security. So these, these problems essentially are coming to us free by, by people who develop all of the technologies of the cloud, and we just have to put our scheme in their structure. So to conclude, military munitions is a large problem for the U.S. There are lots of sites with estimated cost of complete in the you know, billions of dollars. Advanced geophysical classification methods um, detect, queue, and they extract attributes, and they have documented performance. They you know, uh, have show, shown to properly classify UXO. We have lots and lots of QA, QC at each step, and the performance has been validated. UX Analyze is a data analysis and classification software, and it produces a, a very robust QC record and an audit trail of the decision. The benefits of doing something like this, of using UX Analyze for AGC, include a prioritized dig list, a detailed uh, digital record of the decision process, detailed quality control measures and reports, um, measured and derived attributes for all metal items, especially the ones you left in the ground, and the potential, it has the potential for significant cost savings. But it also allows the project team to recommend spend priorities. Once, once they know what the distribution of objects in the ground is, spatially, and then what they are, you know, what the type is, if they're clutter or your soils, the project team can recommend spend priorities in, in a more robust and intelligent way. Uh, so with that, I'll end now, and um, we can address any questions that you might have. Great, thank you so much, Dean. We have a, a lot of questions that have come in. Um, let's start off with a, a specific question about the periodic background measurement. Are they needed for both dynamic and queued surveys? Well, so for dynamic state, for dynamic backgrounds, we we actually use data that are acquired dynamically. But the but the background um, uh, actually I don't know how how to answer that with regards to the crap. I would say yes because uh, when the background measurements are made every couple of hours, we're verifying that the sensor works, and so every couple of hours we do need to repeat and, and verify that the sensor is working. And so if it's not in the crap, our I would recommend it be done anyways. Uh, because we want to, we essentially want to bound the problem as often as we can, and and make sure that we do collect good data. Thank you. 
Um, does the approach you describe work underwater, or is it just limited to land-based MR issues? Well, so that's, yeah, as Herb mentioned, that's an active or an area of, of active research. Um, I think the answer is, is um, migrating towards, and everybody's ex accepting the answer that it is yes. Um, there are issues with regards to the seawater affecting the signature, which, which you know, has been shown, I think, to be negligible uh, using the geometries and the sensors that we, that we do use. There are certainly deployment problems with trying to, you know, to move around and position and, and, and station keep sensors in the right spot. But, uh, but essentially, I think the answer is yes, if, if, we can, um, if we can mitigate, you know, the deployment issues. Um, and, and Herb and, uh, is, is, has funded a number of programs to do, to do that. And I think in the coming years, we will find that um, it will be shown to be successful. Thank you. Um, have you done an analysis of cost savings from the use of UX analyze and or advanced geophysical classification methodologies? Um, well, so I don't know that I have personally, but, but the program office, the SPTP program office has and the government has. Um, but this is a little bit tricky. So, you know, the... Um, the cost savings essentially occur because we can we can mitigate the um, all of the digging associated with the clutter items, and so if you just simply look at the the, the geophysical process of um, of trying to make a classification decision, right? Um, there are the, the cost savings can be very significant. Um, I, I hesitate to put a number on it, but but very significant. You know, by and large, at most of the sites that we go to, you know, there's 1% or 2% or less UXO. And to the extent that we can properly classify those, right, we are, you know, uh, eliminating the need to dig 70 or 80% of the objects or 50% of the objects or, you know, some number in there. So those numbers have been calculated by, by the Corps of Engineers and by ESCCP, and, and there are some statements out there, I, I don't. I'd have to look them up to see exactly what they are. Um, on the on the actual production front, uh, I think it's a little bit. It, it's un it's unknown at the moment because there are regulations with you know with trying to have EOD support and trying to maintain the the flow. Um, so I think from the from the contracting community in NAOC, you know, some would say that the actual costs have not been fully vetted, um, but but they have, they have been taken a look at by the SCCB and, and, and the Corps of Engineers and, um, and significant cost savings results if you, um, if you just kind of look at the geophysical piece of the problem. Great, thank you. A question just came in from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, goes as follows. Several munitions response areas have extremely poor Internet service. How much bandwidth is needed for the typical geophysicist working with a cloud-based software solution? <laughs> well, so, th so that, is a, that is part, that is one of the pieces of our, of our program that we, that we hope to quantify and to state later on. But I don't, I, I don't exactly know at the moment. Uh, I, I do know that I've been stuck in hotels where it's extremely frustrating to have data sets kind of partially work and then fail and partially work and fail and never really able to get it done. So there, as part of the cloud-based program, there is a significant piece that focuses on the ability of the, of the on-site personnel to, to quality control and quality check the data. So, so the, essentially, as part of the cloud-based program, the all, all of the assurance and, and the, the quality control piece of making sure that the data you have collected is adequate and is appropriate will be done on site. The data itself will not be uploaded to the cloud essentially until it is physically possible. So, you know, to the extent that it's not physically possible in a hotel or a remote site, there's nothing that our little program can do about that. And so we have to kind of just wait. But we, we are providing on site quality measures to make sure that they can assure themselves that they are they have acquired enough data to answer the problem. 
Thank you, Dean. We have a question from the California Department of Toxic Substances Control about lead bullet sources on shooting ranges. Um, can the procedures that you describe be used to map and identify subsurface bullets that remain at these shooting ranges? Um, I don't exactly know how to answer that. I, I think that they're extremely tough. They're, they're small. Lead is, is, is different a problem for us than, um, uh, than the, the, the metals that we look for, than the iron-based metals. Um, there, so we have we have tried to investigate that and try to quantify the performance, but but I don't I don't um, I think I think the answer is just forward. I, I don't I, I can't say I can't say yes for sure. Great, thank you. And one last question before we wrap up here: What do you see as the next step I in think, further you know, if, developing? If somebody, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What do you see as the next steps in further developing MR quality assurance and or in UX analyze? Well, yeah, so I think that I think that the steps that we have we have put in place at the moment are good and, and are, you know are, are we're trying to tightly uh tightly marry the steps in UX analyze to the requirements in the PAP and I think that that is is strong. The piece of the problem that still is 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 kind of difficult practically is the data sharing piece and it's the piece of where the cloud will help is is is, is at the moment there's you know to share data you have to send a lot of a lot of data um, back and forth at multiple sites uh, transmission is slow security is not good users end up having different software or different versions of things that, that don't quite work so um, the next in terms of uh, of empowering users to really take advantage and appreciate what's all going on at the same time, I really think is kind of embodied in this sh sharing of the data and the collective common workspace that the cloud provides. So I, in, um, I think the cloud project does try and address the, the you know the major limitations that we currently have. Great. Thank you, Dean, for a very good presentation and for taking the time to entertain the many questions that we've received. As a reminder for our audience, both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. Our next webinar is on Thursday, June 15, and it will be about coupling geothermal heat pumps with underground seasonal thermal energy storage. This is a webinar in the energy and water program area and will feature Mr. Charles Hammock from Andrews Hammock and Powell. Um, with that, I would like to ask you to please take a moment out of your busy day to uh, respond to a very brief survey that will pop up on your screen when the webinar uh, ends. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you again for your time.